So I got my A-level results um, after being raped the night before. Um, uh, very surprised by them because I thought I would fail them all. And, you know, I did, I did get a D in psychology because I literally was in one of the exams I'd written a suicide note rather than actually, oh um, rather than actually do the exam. Hi, I'm Ben Paul Jones. Welcome to this episode of Extraordinary Lives from Lad Bible. I'm sitting here today with Kate Alicia. Um, great to have you, Kate. Um, would you mind just introducing yourself? Um, yeah, my name's Kate Alicia and I'm a grooming gang survivor and a qualified mental health nurse. So obviously the topics that we're going to talk about today are um, very, very dark and upsetting and... Um, if anything's asked in a way that you feel uncomfortable with or you like rephrasing or anything like that, please just do let me know. So for anyone listening that might not be completely clear, what is a grooming gang? Um, so um, wh while I was being um, abused, I didn't really see them as a gang. Mm. They um, were some um, people on the street who um, were actually neighbours of mine mm -hmm. Um, and they, but they, the way they behaved was in a gang-like fashion. Mm. Um, so they were an organised crime gang mm. already, um, but they also engaged in um, the rape and exploitation of young girls. I understand. And it, it, what we're here to talk about today is your very unpleasant experiences with that gang. Where did it start for you? You know, w w when you say that they were they were an organised uh, crime gang that were your neighbours, did you grow up in that kind of area? Did you grow up in like a, a rough neighbourhood and that was natural or was it something you moved into? No, so um, I, I grew up um, like elsewhere, um, n not too far away really, mm. um, but I, um, I moved out of home when I was 18 mm -hmm. um, and um, I know that a lot of um, the sort of typical what you would think of a grooming gang victim would be somebody who's come from a broken home. Okay. But um, it actually, they work on your vulnerabilities and some some people may have come from a, a difficult upbringing, but um, my vulnerabilities were slightly different to that. So... Um, I was, um, I moved out of home when I was 18 because um, my um, house was becoming quite crowded um, and I was old enough to move out. So it wasn't really seen as um, a, a big issue. Mm -hmm. um, so I left home and I moved to the town where I was actually doing my A-levels, um, which was in Telford. Um, and because I'd been there, I was in my second year of um, college, so it, I'd been going to that town every day for the last year and a half, and it looked like quite a nice place to live. Mm -hmm. So um, I moved, um, I did end up moving to um, supported living for um, t uh, young, te like sort of teenagers between the age of 18 and 25. Um, and um, because that was supported, it's a, it's supported accommodation. So it seemed that also seemed to be um, the best place for somebody as young as I was while I was still at college. Um, and um, it just happened that the the um, road that I was living on that I moved into was um, dominated by a particular gang. Mm -hmm. um, you've heard of like. Um, gangs having sort of postcode wars mm. um, and so the the street that I moved into had a um, had a gang on it which I didn't I didn't understand I didn't know anything about um, I was I was only 18 and I'd only just moved home so there was a lot that I didn't didn't know about the world um, and so um, I was kind of very naive and sort of blind to actually what was going on on the street. Was the street itself, when you moved there, did it feel like a dangerous street or did it feel like a normal street in the middle of a town? Um, probably in hindsight, you might have seen um, groups of groups of people or groups of um, men or young, young 
people on the street that actually were part of a gang but you don't want to make that assumption about everyone that you walk past and it had a little park at the end of it and um, it was only a short road and it was the road that um, we that I'd walked through at lunch times to get my lunch between college and the the town centre mm. so it honestly looked like quite a little bright street really mm. with trees on it and you know wouldn't even think anything of it I don't think. Okay. So at the moment, you're a normal student mm -hmm. living a normal life with accommodation that's been sort of subsidised by the college. Is that right? Um, I think it was um, subsidised by the government, right. really. I think it to was help. By the, the council. Rather. Right. Okay. Yeah. And so at what point did you start to fraternise with people that you would later realise were a gang? Um, so, um, I actually, I, um, I was introduced to them by accident because, right. um, technically I was fairly, um, uh, mature for my age really. Mm. And I wouldn't have hung out with them by choice. So I kind of fell into it by accident. Um, and I think it was really through me being a a kind or thinking of myself as a kind person so um when i first moved into the ymca i wanted to make friends with the the other um young people in the ymca so mm. i wasn't um trying to make friends with every neighbor but my next door neighbor that was um in the flat next to mine um and the neighbor um who was on the other side of the block of flats to mine um i made friends with them and they seemed quite um, okay, you know, they were the same age as me. They were like the um, the same sort of people that I would meet at college. Yeah. Um, and um, it started off it started off well, to be fair. It, um, I um, was friends with one of the girls um, and then I was fr friends with one of the boys um, who is William. Um, and um, we had a little group of three of us. Um, and then I had some friends that I worked with um, in my part-time job and we all started hanging out together and there was about a group of five of us in total. Um, and all of that seemed absolutely fine. And um, it was William who had some other friends. Um, and really, I think that he was had come from a broken home or something had... Um, like he'd had more difficult upbringing and he went to um he went to a different col college to us and it was called Nacro and I didn't realize at the time because I didn't know anything about anything mm -hmm. <laughs> um but Nacro is um for children who have um it's a school for children who have behavioral difficulties and may or may not have a criminal record okay so um he uh, I mean he wasn't he wasn't evil. He was he was just vulnerable like we were. Um, and I think we put too much responsibility on boys um, to be more responsible of the girls that they're with. But really, I just think that he'd got mixed up in the gang, um, probably because he was either taking drugs or um, they'd coerced him into selling drugs, which I don't know. I'm just speculating. Um, and... Um, he was friends with them and I don't feel like it was necessarily by choice. Um, I think they were quite pushy with him. Um, they used to use his flat for um, using like dealing drugs or um, what he described as having sex with other girls. So mm. he would they would use his flat because they couldn't use their own house or that was their excuse. Mm. Um, and at the time it didn't sound right. But, you know, to begin with, we didn't know at all. Mm. Um, and then uh, um, as sort of weeks go on of being friends with someone, they open up a bit more mm. um, and he starts telling us these things are a bit odd. Um, so that's um and he yeah that's how we we end i ended up meeting these other people on the street that were members of gangs through william through mm -hmm. being friends with william mm -hmm. you met the, the these other members that lived on the street through william mm -hmm. and they were it sounds like they were exploiting him when you say they're using his flat and yeah. to do things to deal drugs and yeah. things like that um how did you begin to get more involved with them mm -hmm. um so uh there was the, the, I was having some difficulties with them. Um, uh, William um, had, uh, so, so he would sell his phone um, to cash converters 
to buy drugs um, or to, I don't know, maybe to live on, um, for money to live on. And then he would buy his phone back at the end of the month when he got paid again. Right. Um, and while he um, didn't have a mobile phone, he was giving my number out without permission uh. um, as a way of getting in touch with him. So people started calling me to say, um, is William there? And I'd be like, and, and then they would be calling me for other reasons. If I said William's not there, then they'd be trying to make conversation with me over the phone. Okay. Um, and that's how they kind of got to hear of me. Um, I don't know if William had talked to them. If he had, I think it would have, it wouldn't have been in a malicious way. It would have been in an in, in innocent way. So perhaps he told them that he fancied me or that he liked me in some way, or I've met this girl and I like her. Um, and they, because they were actually using him and taking advantage of him, they wanted to have one up on him by getting his girl or the mm. girl that he fancied, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, so there was there was a male dominant thing going on between him and them at the time. Um, and that's how I they ended up getting I like they got my attention or I got their attention. Yeah, you sort of radar. came into into the radar like you Yeah, said. yeah. And what was the if you don't mind me asking and you you're happy to say, what was the first incident? Um, so, I mean, William had mentioned that, that Shamil was getting out of prison. I didn't know who Shamil was. Um, it was the first time anybody had mentioned his name. Mm. Um, he wasn't on the street, so I hadn't even seen him around because he was in prison. Mm. Um, and it was kind of word on the street and, um, they, um, I, they sort of told me things about him, but I didn't really know who he was. Um, and then... The first time um, he, when he got, when he did get out of prison, um, I was warned as well to avoid him. So I was absolutely, to be honest, terrified. I didn't know any criminals, um, and I didn't really want to know any criminals. Did you, did you know what he was in prison for? Um, I'd heard lots of different things, wow, okay. um, but they were all violent. Right. So um, uh, whether it was because he had. Um, broken somebody's jaw, a stranger in the street. He said he'd beaten up somebody, said he'd been be beaten up somebody, stranger in the street, broken their jaw. They were in a hospital. And um, and then I heard that he'd broken into somebody's house with a knife. Obviously, those things are completely different. So I don't know which one is which, um, whether either of them were true, but it sounded like it was something violent anyway. Mm. Um, and when... I, um, the first time I met him, I didn't realise this was Shamil that everybody was talking about because um, William just stopped and started talking to him. Um, and I um, didn't think anything of it at the time. Um, and it wasn't until he um, knocked on my door um, that I actually met him properly. Um, so he knocked on my door. William was actually in... Um, I am um, at mine at the time. And um, I, when I looked through the spy hole, it wasn't him. It was it was a, a, a child. Um, so I didn't know. I didn't know why a child was knocking on my mm. door. So I just answered it. Um, and when I answered the door, um, I had a he's he put his foot through the door so we, I couldn't then close it. The child or Shamil? No, Shamil. The so, child oh. disappeared instantly. So, so do you I'll, think that was like a, he'd done that so to, to make sure you answered the door? He yeah. made a child. Well, yeah, okay, yeah, that's yeah. So he quite intimidating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he tricked me into answering the door by having a child there. Um, and um, yeah, that was obvious from the second the foot was in the door and the child was gone. But there wasn't much I could do about it apart yeah. from try and push him out. Yeah. Um, so I started shouting to um, to William, like, help, <laughs> he's coming, like, someone trying to come in. Um, and William said, is it Shamil? And I, I said, yes. And he said, let him in. Um, I think he probably said let him in because he's scared of him. Yeah. Um, so I, and because he'd instructed me to let him in, psychologically, I just stopped fighting and I let him in because just, and you know like in that split second you really wish that you hadn't done that but mm. then it just because you only had a second to think about it it was just automatic so um 
kind of maybe I was trusting William. I didn't know what was going to happen. Maybe he knew what was going to happen, but I don't think he knew either. So um, also, I don't know if I was winning the fight at the, of at course, the door. Yeah. So I could feel as guilty as I like about that that se- split second that I let go of the door. But whether I was winning the fight or not is, yeah. is um, another question because it was a foot in the door. I don't know what I would have done. Um, so then he he came in he made some excuse to william and then william left and the thing is william is scared so he would just do what you told him to mm-hmm. um and then william didn't come back and um then he was alone with me in the flat and it's kind of like that moment that the door shut and william had left and then shamil was in the flat with me was like the second that you realise like in how much danger you're actually in. Um, and it was, um, he was, he was like literally circling me. Um, and I was like a, I was a bit like a scared rabbit basically. So there was no pretense of friendship. It was just an immediate sense of intimidation. Um, he was, um, so he was saying things that appeared like friendship, but it was absolutely terrifying. So it was like, I want you to be my girlfriend. This is a stranger that I'd never met before. And he's just come out of prison for something violent. Um, and he was saying things like, I will, I'll buy you a car. I'll buy you a house. And I was thinking, how is a criminal going to buy me a house? Like, I'm just terrified about what's happening right now. Um, and, um, he was trying to hug me and he was trying to kiss me and I was trying to push him off me. Um, and, but not in a, not in a, I was trying not to be aggressive because I didn't want him to be aggressive back to me. Mm -hmm. I was really terrified. Um, so that's kind of how, it started and then it just progressed from there um he uh, like was trying to he was trying he was undressing me and I couldn't stop him from undressing me I was trying to say like don't do that and um stop and um can don't take my underwear off and um, I was just trying to plead with him and you know it sounds really pathetic but I was so scared of course um, it doesn't and, sound pathetic at all. It sounds terrifying. Yeah, sorry. Um, oh. And um, uh, it, I managed to, I don't know, bargain with him somehow to leave my underwear on. I just said, please leave my underwear. Don't like, don't take anything else off. Like, just stop na- now at that. Um, and then he was because he was trying to be pretend to be nice he was like okay I'll leave your underwear on um and then he um put me down on the bed um and got on top of me and then he was um undressing him he must have undressed himself first sorry but like he was in his boxes and I, I even remember the color um, which I won't share with you. Mm. Um, but, um, he, he was like, he was like, like he agreed not to leave my, um, underwear on. So he just moved my underwear out of the way and then started to rape me. And I knew what he was doing, but I just was too terrified to like say anything else. Mm -hmm. Um, and, I just had to like wait underneath him until he'd stopped. Um, And um, I'd done like all the pleading that I could possibly do. And then when he started to rape me, I thought like I haven't, I can't actually get out of this anymore. Like it's happened now. So um, I've just got to wait till it's over. Sorry. No, you don't need to apologize. It's awful situation. And, after he'd finished, did he leave the house? Um, actually, I think he just wanted to put me... I don't know why he, he's... Uh, so I think he was a bit of a psycho. Mm. Um, uh, I can't even say that in a nice way, to be to be honest. And I don't think I should have to say it in a nice way. Of course. Um, he... I don't know what what was going through his head, but um, he, what he, like... He was asking me afterwards, like, if I found him attractive and he was asking me if um, um, 
what I thought of his body um, and I was very aware that I'd just been raped mm-hmm. and I was also still very terrified of him. So um, I, but I also wasn't going to give him the satisfaction of like what he wanted to hear. Mm-hmm. So I was like, and, and I was at the point where I didn't care anymore as well. So like he just raped me. So I actually hate you and um I now kind of wish I was dead as well. So I don't really care what you do to me if I tell you you're ugly and Mm. that I hate you. And um, so I said those things um, and he was like, what? Um, But he didn't react. I don't think he knew how to react because I don't think he knew what he was doing. I don't Mm. think he was all there psychologically. Um, And um, and then he took me around to William's house, um, William's flat. And then he was saying in front of William, don't worry, I only got her to give give me a blowjob, which isn't even remotely what happened at all. And I don't know why he was saying that to him. And um, and I was just the the entire time I was still shaking and not saying anything because I thought, what am I going to? say I just want really wanted to get rid of him so I Mm. thought if I just wait until he's gone then um then I can actually process what's just happened um and then he he wanted to leave Williams flat so he left and um then he wanted to kiss me and I had to be like pinned me against the wall and I had to kiss him and then he left um and then finally I was on my own and I thought god that was awful um And then William came back round and then William was having a go at me because he was like, how could you give him a blowjob? And and I was just, oh, Mm. I was just, you know, that didn't even have, that's not what happened. Just leave me alone. Um, And it's actually really messed up. It's Mm. really, really messed up. Um, And it's not like what it might look like in the movies. And it's not, you know, it doesn't make any sense. Um, And, you know, one thing would lead to to another. And um, William pretended to leave my flat after we'd gone back round um, and then I called my friend on the phone who's my friend from school and I told her that I'd just been raped um, and this was like the first moment I'd actually got to be myself um, and um, she cried, I cried and she cried on the phone with me and it was like a really upsetting moment. Um, but then... I had to go because William hadn't really left because he'd wanted to actually spy on what I was going to say to my friend. And then he realised that I'd been raped. And then he was like really apologetic for the way he just behaved. Um, And he wanted to help me and he wanted to um, call his auntie and um, see, because he wanted a an adult woman to talk to me to see what to do next. And they were all talking about going to the police. I was like, oh my good, you know, I couldn't, yeah. I hadn't had time yet to like process anything. So I was like still in like this absolute shock and still shaking. Sorry, I'll give no. you space to No, 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 <laughs> no, please. Would, would you now. like a, to take, have some water? Yeah, probably. Yeah, yeah. Are you okay? Yeah, I yeah. think so. Okay. Well, just let us know if you want a, a longer break. Okay. So, okay, so, I mean, that, that's, that's quite a huge change in, in your experience living in that area. Mm. Um, and it's, this individual, Shamil, was clearly very dangerous and disturbed. Was he part of a wider group or was he kind of a lone agent at that point? Um, he had, he had some family members he had a brother and he had a cousin and um i sort of was aware of that but um i hadn't you know i didn't understand the way gangs were yeah um so i felt like he was a lone agent but he clearly wasn't um and i think me not realizing that he was part of a wider gang was even was you know was a, a dangerous for me, because yeah. the risk was a lot higher than I anticipated. Um, so when I finally did speak to the police a few um, days later, so it wasn't, I didn't, hadn't left it too long. I just, you know, needed to process. And lots of people were trying, who I told, I hadn't told lots of people, but the people I had told were trying to convince me to speak to the police. Right. Yeah. So um, I went to the police and um, I spoke to them 
in absolute um, confidence because I so I I never told anybody. I didn't tell William. I didn't tell my friend, my next door neighbour who, who we were friends with. I didn't tell my family. I because I was I was really terrified yeah. of what Shamil might do or what his family might do to me if they knew that I was speaking to the police yeah. about what he'd done. Um, so. Um, when and what I go just going back to um, the actual risk I was in. So when I'm speaking to the police, I don't realise what's going to happen next. Um, I'm too scared to if I you know I've got this ideal in my head that if he's arrested, they'll have to tell him what he's arrested for. So they'll arrest him and they'll take him to prison, and everyone will know what he did um right. and that it was me that reported it yeah and then the other dangerous people on the street like his um brother and his cousin are going to come around and be like why have you just reported my mm -hmm. brother or cousin to the police now look now look what's happened so i was terrified i was really really scared um and i don't think i got the right advice but if i'd have realized that the the wider gang was and this was a plot. So it was a, it, this was a plot. They'd set Shamil on me because Shamil is the, um, the ag aggressor as it were. So I don't know, I don't know what they call it. The, the Rottweiler of the group or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, so if somebody needs beating up, they'll send him out. Um, and, um, if somebody needs to be raped, they'll send him out. Um, so they knew that it would make me more vulnerable, mm -hmm. um, to being abused by them as well. So okay. they, um, so two days later, um, Ali came around with his friend, um, and I was raped again by Ali and, and his friend. Um, was this someone you knew already or a stranger? Um, so I knew of Ali. Um, but again, um, I'd only been there a month, so I don't, oh, I actually, this is after just the, it, a month of living oh, in the wow, YMCA. Okay. Yeah. So I'd only been out a month. Oh, um, uh, so I barely knew any of them. Yeah. Um, and I'd barely had chance to, um, you know, I'd had, um, a couple of introductions. Ali was one of the guys who had called me on the phone asking right. for William. Yeah. Um, but I didn't really know them at all. Okay. Um, so, and I didn't know his friend at all. He was a complete stranger. And this was the first time that like, obviously that anything like that had ever happened to me. But until so you, you had told the police. So did that, did anything happen from that? Um, I, um, I told the police about Shamil. Shamil. Yeah. And, um, I'd said, I told them that I was afraid of him being arrested. Mm. Um, so they, were because I was I was told by um, the pe my counsellor um, at college that if I wanted that I should tell the police at least for their information um, so that they've got the sort of intelligence on yeah. him um, and that if I didn't want him to be arrested then I didn't have to do that and the reason that I was worried about him being arrested was because of what would the repercussions of, course, of that? Yeah. Um, I wasn't really um, reassured about it, so there was nothing like, "Oh, let me let us help you tell your family, and then maybe you can go back home um, and where you'll be safe, or we could rehouse you somewhere where you could be feel safe." Because I lived on the same street as Shamir, yeah. and I lived on the same street as his as Ali Sultan as well, and um, his and his brother and his you know and the other people that could put, potentially be a risk to myself, to my life, to me physically. But when um, but did the police when you told them did they give you options or did you give the advice or was it more like thank you for the report that's now I now records? Uh, well, the advice was. Um, if you want him to be arrested, um, report it as rape. But if you don't want... So it, w it was this way around. So if you don't want him to be arrested, you have to say it was consensual. Right. But if you say that it's rape, then we have to arrest him. Right, okay. So they wrote me a statement um, to say it was consensual, which... Uh, 
seems to be common practice really for the police to actually write your statement for you. Okay. But I was quite surprised by that. Yeah. Um, and all I had to do was sign the statement that had been written for me right. to say that it was consensual. And then it would just go down as intelligence. Right. Okay. So uh, it sounds like it started to spiral quite quickly from the point of Shamil to Ali and his friend coming around. How quickly then did it spiral further out of control? Um, I think really it's it, it, it was spiralling from the first rape. So two days later, um, I was raped by Ali and his friend. And then another two days after that, um, I was raped by his brother. Um, a, a few um, weeks after that, Ali would keep coming back round. Um, it was it was it wasn't every day, but it was roughly twice a week, and sometimes it would be two men in a day. Um, and yeah, so I'm I'm aware that uh, with other victims, it, it escalates and it becomes multiple multiple men um, in a night or in one weekend. Um, this was a very beginning of the grooming for me. So I was I didn't have that period of time where they. Um, were giving me gifts and um, tr weaning me into being friends with them. They just went straight in with um, quite traumatic mm. um, rape incidents and events for me. And sorry, this this is going to seem like an incredibly sorry. insensitive question, but why didn't you leave the area at that point? Um, I um, so I. I was planning to leave. I was thinking in my head, like, I've got to get out of here. Mm. But I didn't actually know how mm. because I um, was helped into the YMCA in the first place. So I filled in a form um, and they found me a flat to live in. So I didn't actually know how to move house at that time. Like, I didn't mm. know how to get away. I didn't know how to tell my family because I put a lot of blame on myself. And I think that the way that I would have described it to my family because of the blame, the self-blame, they would have blamed me as well. So I thought everyone would blame me. I thought it was my fault. I thought I'd got myself into a really bad situation. Um, and I was ashamed. Mm -hmm. So I found it really difficult to actually say, help me. I'm, I'm like, I really desperately need help. Um, so I, and I didn't know how to help myself. Um, so it took me a, a, um, a couple of months. Um, so not long, but it took me a little while to actually figure out how to move, to move. Um, it, it couldn't have been an in instant thing for me. During the period this was happening and escalating, were you still attending college? Um, yeah. So, um, it, I was at the end of my A, my A levels, so um, when I for, for the first uh, I didn't say I didn't mention that, but for the first the first rape when I was first raped by Shamil, the one that I just described, um, it was the weekend before all my major exams. Oh. So I had um, six exams in five days um, that that following week, and he'd raped me on the Sunday, and my next my exam was going to be on the Monday. I think I had a psychology exam on Monday, um, and then I had an English exam and a psychology exam on the Tuesday. Um, I had a biology exam on the Wednesday, and then I went to the police on the Wednesday. Um, and then, you know, I had some more exams on the Thursday and Friday. And then I spoke to the, and I was raped again on Thursday. Um, and I went back to the police and gave the statement on the Saturday. So, um, after that, um, because all my exams were over, I, it was the, um, it was the, um, summer holidays mm. um, and I was waiting for my A-level results. Mm -hmm. um, so I was even um, raped the day before I um, got my A-level results and I, you know, walked up to um, college in a bit of a daze to like pick them up and I expected to fail everything, but I didn't luckily. Okay, so the, the, the experience is horrifying and, and probably at that age and probably hard to process in terms of like what do you do when this has started happening but what with, with with a grooming gang what what is the purpose for them to 
begin to do this to you? As in, are they trying to make you somebody that's like a slave to them? Or are they trying to, you know, uh, is it simple, simply sexual abuse? Why, when you said that they had um, Shamil as the kind of attack dog that would go out and, and do this, why would they do this to people? So um, I don't know if they are fully aware of what they're trying to do mm. themselves. Okay. Um, maybe that's me not giving them the amount of intelligence they deserve or whether it's, you know, I, I get the feeling that it's um, it's a learnt behaviour from them. Mm -hmm. So they just know, they know how to do it because they've been sexually abused themselves mm -hmm. is, is how I feel. But um, with the Telford Grooming Gang, um, they were um, also... The, the people who raped me um, were also already forcibly pimping out other underage girls um, as well. So they were doing that for money um, and they were, um, they had been grooming them probably, and, and well, I know in a very similar way to the way they groomed me um, to accept this lifestyle mm. um, and then so they could continue to abuse you. And I think that these traumatic, really traumatic events that they inflict on you um, is a way of breaking a, a human being mm. the same way that you break a horse. Mm. So I kind of felt that way. I would like, when I, when I was like in the, pits of my depression about it I would feel that I'd been broken um like you break a horse when um I don't know if you know how they break horses but they um so I'm talking about like a wild horse mm -hmm. and making taming a wild horse so you um tie it to I don't know everything about no, fine, horses, go ahead, but like yeah, yeah. <laughs> mm. um so you, I think you tie you tie it to a post and then you sort of chase, chase it this is the um simplistic version you chase it round in a circle until eventually it physically it, like it's physically exhausted and then it gives up and then you can tame it from then and you can teach it um how, you can teach it the tricks and it's will's been to, broken I yeah, yeah yeah um yeah. so I feel like that's what they did to me they mm. broke my will to well broke my will to live mm. um and then or def the will to defend myself um and then I gave up mm. and I gave up on myself and I think there's even a very I think I I feel like I can even pinpoint the moment it happened um and um the moment I've felt like this was my life now and I'm now I'm a slut and I can't actually change that and there's nothing else I can do and that's it from now on mm. um and that's what that's kind of how how they bring you into it sorry that I went on I feel like I went off on a tangent no no it's it's it, it makes complete sense and it's a really clear description for like because for me it's just so hard to the two things that are so hard to process is the pain on of what you were put through and the cruelty that these people inflicted on other humans and the explanation on both sides there about the fact that it was a learnt behaviour and the breaking of the horse, which is a very good analogy, make it does make it very understandable. So I know we, we've met before and uh, I remember you talked about a, a party incident and I was wondering if you would tell us about that. Um, so, uh, I was taken to a party, um, by a guy that I'd essentially uh, met very recently. Well, mm. that, that day actually. Um, but I'd been, so I'd been raped. Um, I w actually, I was actually four months into being raped, um, twice a week or three times a week. Um, so I was quite psychologically damaged at that mm, point um, and going through quite a lot um, and not sure where my head was at um, and a very vulnerable state in my um, ordeal really but um, he took me to a, a party um, and um, there were he so first of all he um, took me 
he wanted to he wanted to get me drunk, but I didn't actually drink. So he'd taken me to um, the uh, Tesco to like pick up some alcohol. And um, sorry, was this a member of the gang or was this someone you'd met separately? I'm, well, it, it all it all looks separate. Sure. So you um, felt like he wasn't a member of the got gang. Got you. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I felt like I'd met him separately, but actually I met him on the same street, so mm. why would I even think mm-hmm. that? But um, uh, So he took me to Tesco um, and I sat in the car and waited for him to come out and he picked up some Smirnoff um, vodka, which, um, I mean, it's, it is a, t- is a tactic that they use for 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 their victims and they used and it probably worked on other victims but I hated alcohol and I specifically hated vodka so um I was just rolling my eyes and thinking oh god he's bought vodka Mm. um and um but I didn't I didn't say anything and then um and then he drove me all round he took me onto a dual carriageway and then he I don't know how like drove a really long way basically to somewhere an area that I actually knew um which was not that far away from my house okay. um it was actually um uh next to the Morrisons which was my local um shopping center that I walked to um shopping what do you call it supermarket that I walked to and um and I thought, why is he? Why is he taking me all this way around? And it didn't make sense to me at the mm. time, but it, I mean, afterwards, in hindsight, it does because you because know, you can always look in hindsight and see all the problems um, and the, all the warning signs. But at the time, I was just confused. I was like, I had, like, no idea why he did that um, when the place is right here. Um, but he was actually trying to confuse me to make it to seem make, like you were going far away. Yeah, he was trying to make me feel lost. Right, um, and he was trying to fake, make me feel helpless, like I couldn't. I wouldn't be able to walk home, but I, cause I, see. I could walk home. Yeah. yeah. And you were drinking, presumably at this point, were you drinking the vodka? As oh God, no. Oh, oh God, okay. no. Right. no, I'll tell, I'll tell you. <laughs> okay. Um, so I, so he poured me a drink at the party. So we got to the party. There were lots of different people there. They weren't, um, they weren't, they were all a mix of different people. Um, but it was mostly men. Um, there were two other women there who were older than me, um, and they were already very, very drunk. Um, so I never really got to know those two mm-hmm. other ladies that were there. Um, and he poured me a drink and he poured me a drink. Um, it was like a, a normal sort of tumbler glass, but it was a tall one. And he poured half vodka and half lemonade in it. There was, a, and I look and I watched him pour it and I thought there's absolutely no way that I'm going to be able to drink mm-hmm. that. Um, and I, cause I, I hated the taste. It made, you know, I couldn't even, yeah, I couldn't even imagine drinking it, but, um, I was embarrassed by that because I was a teenager and it was cool to drink. Um, so I didn't let them know that I wasn't going to drink it. Mm. I just sort of styled it a bit and I was like, you know, how you always find him in the party, at, in the kitchen at parties. Mm. So I was like hanging out in the kitchen with the drink in my hand next to the sink and pretending to take a sip and then pouring it right. when no one was looking, pouring yeah. it into the sink. <laughs> Um, but that was me being like very embarrassed about um, not being able to actually drink. Um, so I think in a way it was, I don't know if I, it, I don't think it helped. I don't think it actually made any difference. I think the only difference it made is that one, um, I remembered what was what happened more vividly and it was a lot more painful. Um, so I don't f- feel like it not drinking didn't really help me mm. um in in either way it might have helped if they'd have known that I wasn't drinking mm. because if they'd have known that I was like fully compass mentors then maybe they would have changed their mind about what they were going to try and make me do maybe they would have had more respect for me because they used um the girl being drunk as an excuse yeah. to say that that's enough reason they shouldn't be drunk and that's why they're they deserve to be raped so maybe if they knew but um, you know it, it might not I don't think it would have made any difference um but yeah so they tried to get me drunk 
they thought so that's another warning sign really but i didn't recognize it i thought it was cool to drink and that's why they were trying to get me drunk and was he being fairly friendly at this point yeah yeah he was not, being, not aggressive no no yeah. no he was lovely and you know he was being nice and his friends were lovely as well and they were all like being welcoming and um there was music on and it was like a normal house party mm. um and then he sort of convinced me into the bedroom a bit later on. Um, I don't know. Maybe I haven't got enough excuse. Maybe I haven't, you know, made, well, I was, you know, I wasn't, um, I was vulnerable and I was already um, being, being raped on a regular basis. And um, part of me was trying to take back control all the time. So I was very confused yeah. about whether I should consent to sex yeah. or whether I shouldn't and what the difference was anymore because I put a lot of blame on myself mm. for times that I'd actually been raped which I thought were consensual because they really pushed me into it or I'd given up at some point mm. and um, um, I'd allowed it to happen to myself and that's how I'd f felt about all these scenarios um, so I was trying to um, very sort of naively trying to be like, I, I, I like to have sex when I want to have sex. Mm. So if I go out and find it, then, you know, maybe that's, um, will make me feel better about sex as a whole. Um, anyway, it, I think they count on that. I think this is another way that they're actually grooming you into being very confused about mm -hmm. consent. Um, so he tricked me into the bedroom. I, I went into the bedroom with him. He obviously knew what he was going to do. Um, and he lied to me the entire time. Um, and, um, and then um, he um, raped me anally. It's really difficult to talk about. Um, and I think one, one reason I talk about it is because it is so humiliating that that, humiliate, that humiliating feeling um, used to be a um like a feeling that would induce suicidal thoughts in myself okay and now i share that because that humiliation stops you from seeking help okay um and now i just now i don't care because i think if i if i put my th myself through admitting what happened then um, that humiliation can no longer rule me anymore. Yeah. Um, so that's why that's one of the reasons that I talk about this particular rape because I think it is really humiliating, and I think that it's a it's one thing that happens to some rape victims, and they don't want to come forward because they blame themselves for like literally putting themselves in the bedroom alone with them mm. in that vulnerable situation, and then this this is what happens, and that therefore it's their fault, mm. which is which is wrong. Um, and I'll just, sorry, I'll just describe it though. Um, no, you don't have to. No, no, I won't describe. I'm not, no, okay. I'm going to describe um, why it's a crime. Okay. Um, in the Sexual Offences Act, um, you can consent to some things and not consent to other things. Okay. And um, if you make your consent clear, then, um, or your non consent clear, and they and the person who is perp the perpetrator knows that you are not consenting, then that's rape. And you can also, in the Sexual Offences Act, consent to something and then withdraw your consent at any time. Okay. And then it's rape. Then it becomes rape. So you can so you can consent to a sexual act at the beginning, but if you try and you, you signal that you want to stop and they don't stop, then they know that you're not consenting anymore yeah. and that becomes rape. Um, so it's not really up, up for debate for the individual people who are thinking in whether you deserve it or you yeah. don't deserve it. In the eyes of the law, that was non-consensual sex, which is rape. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so um, I was raped anally by him. I tried to escape. I screamed. I shouted. I said stop. Um, one reason was because at the beginning I thought it was an accident, so I didn't actually expect him to continue to try and have sex with me after I was saying that it was um, that I 
you know, that I was in pain. Um, he knew what I was going to do and he knew that I was going to try and pull away, which, which now I can look in hindsight and say he had experience. Mm -hmm. So he knew that it was going to be painful and he knew what a victim does mm -hmm. when that pain hits you, which is to pull away. And he knew I was going to pull away and he f was already prepared for that. So he pushed his body to, into mine, knowing that if he did that, I couldn't escape. Mm -hmm. um, and I smacked my head on the headboard. I was trapped and he knew that I was trapped there. And he um, then I just had to wait until he was finished. Um, and, you know, that's horrible. And that is intentional rape. Mm. That is intentional rape from someone who is an ex experienced serial rapist. Um, and that's the reason that I share that, that um, incident even to this day. And um, unfortunately, um, I did report that to the police, but it, um, it, but they didn't, couldn't find enough evidence that we even knew each other. He said that he'd never met me before um, and um, they couldn't put, because no one at the party would come forward either, they couldn't put me and him in the same room together ever. So I couldn't even prove that I knew him or, you know, I don't know what, why, because I ID'd him in an ID parade. Um, wow. But, yeah. And it's still... Yeah. Yeah. So I am... Um, what do you call it when you sort of positively ID yeah. him in an ID parade? Um, but that still wasn't enough evidence to to take it forward. Or that's what the police said to me. Um, sometimes they don't tell you the truth. Yeah. Um, which is the yeah. Uh, you you come across as very strong, by the way. Oh, thank when you. When you're telling the story, you come across as a very strong person. Oh, thank you. Mm. Hi there, this is Ben Powell Jones. We're just going to take a quick break from today's episode to talk a little bit about our sponsor. A brand new six-part podcast from Message Heard and Podimo, Who Robs a Banksy follows journalist Jake Warren as he sets out to explore the stranger-than-fiction tale of the man who kidnapped a Banksy statue from the middle of central London in broad daylight and held it to ransom. The act would lead to an almost 20-year war of bad blood, relations and legal battles that are still being waged today, and it all comes down to one man and one vendetta. But it doesn't end there. The story will take us on a journey through the UK's most subversive subcultures, from art heists and art terrorists to 80s football hooliganism and the 90s illegal rave scene. And throughout it all, Jake will be trying to get hold of the most elusive and famed anonymous artist in the world. In this new six-part series, host Jake Warren speaks to the Tiger King of the art scene, Andy Link, and those closest to Banksy himself, exposing their two-decade-long feud and attempting to track down the world's most elusive anonymous artist. Who Robs a Banksy is available from the 3rd of May, wherever you get your podcasts. To hear the whole series early and ad-free, subscribe to Podimo UK on Apple Podcasts. Now back to the episode. Sorry, you were asking me about the party. No, that's fine. I, I, I guess in trying to understand the things that these people do and the sort of like depths that they'll go to, why do you think that he bothered pretending to be nice and pretended to be different from the gang? Um, they want you to consent for as long as possible. I think it's not in, first of all, they, um, I think they enjoy the, the chase as it were. They enjoy the pretense. So they, um, use it as a, um, uh, again, a reason to disrespect you. They use it as a re uh, as a way of laughing at you behind your back. Right. Um, they use it as um, look at this silly girl; she deserves it. So they're looking for reasons all the time why you deserve to be abused. Um, and um, and if you're consenting for the longest and complying for the longest period of time, they have less work to do to get what they want out of you. Um, it makes it easier for them to abuse you at the last minute. Do you think, I mean, it's probably conjecture, but do you think they view women as lesser beings, like lower life forms? I mean, the thought of putting people through these things do you think they were treating men in the same way maybe not with sexual abuse but in other ways or do you think it's specifically women uh so i think you know misogyny was involved i think there is a hatred there for women um but i also think there's an element of um um it's called dissocial personality disorder um but it 
it used to be called psychopathic personality disorder, um, where they really cannot identify with the um, with the feelings and mm. of in, of other mm. individuals, and actually um, sort of aiming to please themselves all the time, and they yeah. can't. Um, identify with other people's pain it's like a complete lack of empathy yes complete lack of empathy yeah um and i believe that you know there's, there's several things at, at play there for the reason why they can why they can actually do this to women or anyone okay well that i mean awful story and an awful experience um but i'm aware that at some point you started to try to, to plan an escape didn't you for to go to university Mm. Mm. So how did that come about? Um, so I was, um, so I got my A-level results um, after being raped the night before. Um, uh, very surprised by them because I thought I would fail them all. And, you know, I did I did get a D in psychology because I literally was in one of the exams I'd written a suicide note rather than actually, oh um, rather than actually do the exam. And so um, handed it? Did you give that in? Yeah, I mean, it was a bit cryptic, so it wasn't okay. it, it wasn't obvious that that I was, you know, I wasn't saying oh, I'm going to kill myself okay. now because maybe they would have flagged that up and done. Well, something. you'd hope so. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was more like a. Um, it was actually more like a sorry, sorry, sorry to have let you down, and um, oh, it's really upsetting to remember now. But sorry to have like wasted your time um, because you're going to open this. Um, exam paper and it's completely blank <laughs> so um, that it was along those lines so I would sort of written a cryptic suicide note but it probably just looked like oh, an apology basically mm -hmm. um, so I knew that I'd failed that exam um, and uh, hang on a minute where am I and then you, but you had got an uh, yeah, uh, but upgrade yeah to... yeah I got a C in English and I was like yes <laughs> I wouldn't even expect that but I was like oh um, something uh, uh, over a C, you know, is much better than I was expecting. Mm. Anyway. Um, and um, because before that, my plan had, I had some little plans in my head and I was thinking, let me go back to college and retake my um, last year. Mm. And then at least most of the time I'll be out. Like if I can continue being a, a full-time student, I'll be out of my flat yeah. most of the time. So, um, they won't be able to find me at home as they were doing during the summer holidays. Um, and, um, my next, my next plan was maybe I can get a job and I'll be out most of the time. Yeah. Um, I'd, I'd got a part-time job, but I mean, you know, a better job that had more hours. Um, and, um, but then when I got my A-level results, um, I'd gone back to college to try and go back and mm. they'd say, well, you've got decent A-level results, oh, no. so we're not going to fund you for another year. Right. And they were a bit like matter of fact with me. And I was like, oh, no. And then I was like, oh no, that plan's not going to work. And, and they said, we'll put you with the student advisor so that you can find out what university you can go to. Um, and when I met the student advisor, oh, she was lovely. A really, really nice lady. Um, I was actually quite, I'd had a fight with William at the time and I was all bruised up. Um, oh, and a physical fight? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. A physical fight, um, which I don't feel too bad about because I don't feel like I was beaten up. I feel like it was a fair fight. We literally, okay. I, I hit him first. Um, and then, you know, it was, you know, it's all going on anyway. Um, but she felt bad for me because I was bruised, I was bruised up. So I'd clearly been in some sort of physical altercation. Um, I was a young girl and she was like, you should look after yourself better. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, she, uh, said, do you want to go to university this year or next year? At that point it was September. So, um, I had to double take for a minute and I said, this year, like how much, ha like there was only four year months of the year left. I was like, what do you mean this year? And she was like, yeah, you can apply f through something called clearing, mm. um, which is where they're trying there's some spaces left at university on the courses. So they're trying to get rid of them as quickly as possible so you can apply. Um, and um, I wanted to do psych psychology, but that's why I was doing A-level psychology. Um, but all the places were t sort of taken up for psychology. And I didn't want to, um, I didn't want to 
wait a year no and i didn't want to go to a university that was nearby either. Yeah, so i yeah, didn't want to go to wolverhampton university and i didn't want to go to birmingham university um nothing against those universities it's they were just cl- yes too close too local yeah. yeah too close and i thought that they, they can come and get me mm. if um if i go to either of those locations so um we looked at mental health nursing um and um there were lots of places and i think we might have picked the first university on the list, which was, or one of the first universities on the list, which was Anglia Ruskin, A in mm-hmm, alphabetical order. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, and um, she really bent over backwards to get me into oh. the university. Yeah, she. So um, she'd seen something there. Yeah. And at this point, how long had it gone on for with the Telford gang? Um, so it had been going on for. Um, four months, five months. Um, you did manage to escape, so to speak, to university and you got a place in university and you moved there, which you hoped would be the end of the situation. But unfortunately it wasn't, was it? Uh, no. Um, uh, I, I mean, so to begin with, um, I was very glad that I'd escaped. So, um, I was like you can't imagine the relief yeah um, actually of uh, and I I really liked the town I I like suddenly had this appreciation for life like so I loved the town I loved the um the bricks in the in the street and where where, where, where was this sorry again um it was in Chelmsford Chelmsford, yeah and it's um some of the buildings are like fairly new or they they were anyway at the time and um so maybe the maybe the floor had been recently changed in the high street or something and I was just in love with everything I just thought oh my god this is great um I even even at university they had these um automatic hand uh, sanitize the gel in mm-hmm. the toilets would come out and it smelt like um it was a cherry flavor and I'd even remember the smell of that and um thought it was great because it reminded me of like when we were kids and we had some shampoo that was cherry um flavored smelt what's this scented, scented yeah, yeah. <laughs> um and um so I was really glad I was like I felt lucky to be alive I thought oh my god I've like actually made it I've got it out of there um and um very quickly though um I started to develop symptoms of PTSD Mm. but I didn't realize what that was at the beginning so it started off with um it started off with flashbacks, but I wasn't conscious of the flashbacks, so I didn't know that oh, I was wow. having memories. Um, and um, I sort of the first I would know about it was that I would be first I'd be fine, sort of trying to do some work on the computer in my room um, in halls at university, and then the next thing I know, I would be sitting underneath my desk, crying, and then I would be like why am I crying? So I wouldn't even feel the emotion of crying. So I wouldn't even like, so it would be, it was so very almost like lost space. Like you just yeah. have these blackout periods. Like a blackout period. Yeah. 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 Um, and I, um, so this was happening sort of probably a, about twice a week. Um, and um, sort of a few weeks into it, I caught myself shouting at Ali so shouting at Ali Sultan, who was one of the men who'd abused me. Mm. Um, and, but there was no one there, obviously. This was a past event and I was repeating the same words that I'd said to him at the time. Or, or And it just suddenly made me aware that I was having a memory. And this wasn't like a nightmare. This was like awake. Awake, yeah. Conscious, awake, not like and, awake. And just suddenly having a, a vivid flashback. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So um, I... I realised what I was remembering and I, so I realised the incident that I was remembering and I didn't even realise that was an issue. So I didn't realise I'd been traumatised by that situation because I'd been so groomed in like, and into believing that everything I was doing was consensual mm. that that incident that had happened was just like another day while I was living there. But all of a sudden I was having these memories about it and I, I thought it was bizarre so I like I was shouting at Ali and I thought why am I shouting at Ali mm. why am I rem- why am I having this memory why do, why am I even bothered about it why am I crying and you know it was a, a bit of a 
a shocking moment for me you know it stays with me now so I just you know really had no idea what was going on um and I think you know that's when I started realizing that I was more bothered by what had happened than than I realized and mm -hmm. um, that I'd, I'd first realized um and I called them I called them episodes because I didn't know how to explain what they were mm. um, and it was happening so early on when I started uni that even though I was doing mental health nursing we hadn't got to that bit yet mm. so we were actually doing a foundation course in um the in the first year um which had all the different nursing as aspects of it so we weren't doing mental health nursing mm -hmm. we were doing um uh, like general adult nursing um and so we hadn't got to that bit so I didn't know what was what the hell was going on um and I didn't recognize them as a panic attack because maybe it wasn't a panic attack um but I, I didn't feel in panic I felt upset and I felt distressed but I didn't even know if I knew what to call it distress so you basically you basically it sounds as though you didn't have the tools to identify what was happening to, yeah to, to, to identify kind of trauma or yeah post traumatic stress and yeah. things like that yeah exactly exactly um so certain things would trigger me off as well and i couldn't identify triggers mm. um but um one one trigger was like when i you know be because you just have to live it because you're living it every day when you're being raped every day but you still have to get up and carry on and mm. um feed yourself and you know every time i open the fridge or every time i cooked pasta on the on the hob when i was eating um i would maybe have a memory of the time that I was eating pasta in the YMCA, but I knew I was being about to be, or I had just got raped afterwards or after I'd been raped, I had something to eat. So I'd always have this feeling that it was still going on. Mm. Um, and then I would end up in my room again on the floor, crying my eyes out mm. because I tried to make pasta. Um, and, um, I thought it was really weird and I didn't know how to explain it to anyone. And were you, were you, at that point in time, were you building relationships and friendships in university or were you kind of just tr keeping yourself away, keeping your head down? So I, I was trying at uni, yeah. um, but I um, felt really, I couldn't help it. I felt really different to everyone. Yeah, of course. I felt like um, other people are... Um, other people my own age are um, just come from their parents' house mm. and they are um, like free and innocent and they want to go out and party. And I was a, probably a bit terrified of partying mm. um, because of the party incident. Um, and I was probably a bit more terrified of drinking as well because of the incident. Um, and so I wasn't interested in any of the things they were doing and I just felt very different to them um and I felt like if they knew what had happened or who I was because I was this really bad person that had been behaving very like sexually bad um then they wouldn't like me mm. so I thought I was a bad person and that I was keeping this really bad horrible secret about who I was um I felt like I'd got a second chance to start again um and not let people have that reputation of, about me but I was keeping that I had to keep that a secret from people so um I found it really difficult to make friends for that reason yeah, yeah it makes complete sense and and what was the point that because eventually what happened was you got connected to a different gang, didn't you? Yeah. So um, while I was still in the YMCA in Telford, um, there had, um, it was Shamil. Shamil had um, been in prison with, um, so he, he introduced me to his cousin who was still in prison. Mm. His cousin who was in prison um Kate was coming out on day release because he was in a Cat D prison where they allow them to come out. Mm -hmm. um, he was um, friends with or connected with someone else in prison who was part of another gang. And um, he 
I don't know, sold my number or sold my details or gave them, traded my details for something else in prison um, and um, sort of set up a meeting with me and um, another man from Birmingham. Um, and that's how I ended up with the Birmingham, introduced to the Birmingham gang. Um, when I met that man, he was a lot nicer to me um, than the Telford gang. Um, he... Um, would tell me that they were wrong for the way they were treating me. I would confide in him. So I found friendship in him. Um, and I found that I felt like I could be myself with them because I could be honest about my life in the YMCA with them mm. and they wouldn't find it weird. They, they had, they understood because they were living the life as well. Um, obviously not under the same circumstances as myself, but from, being in that circle, mm. as it were. Um, and um, so I was introduced to him and then I was introduced to other members of his gang, um, other members of his family. And they were nice to me and they were okay with me. And I found it easier to hang out with them because they weren't as hateful and um, sort of in intentionally abusive as the gang in Telford. Mm. Um, so the gang in Telford were really evil to me. They were like, they intended to inflict harm on me. Mm. They were laughing at me, embarrassing me, um, humiliating me, making me feel intentionally worthless. And then I had this gang in Birmingham who were being nice to me and welcoming and um, sort of not being forceful or pushy. Yeah. Um, but still expecting from me what the other gang had. Um, but because I was more experienced now um, with, with the extreme experience that I'd had from the Telford gang, I kn knew how they wanted me to behave um, and how to behave in a way that would make them have more respect for me. It's, it's, it's complicated to explain, but mm. this is the effects of the, the manipulation, yeah. what actually happened um, through the, the trauma that they put me through um, was intentional to get me to be start behaving in a way that um, they was socially acceptable in their circle, yeah. if that makes sense. And then that made me feel comfortable in their circle and segregated me from everyone else. And were you still when you, with the Birmingham gang, were you at university at this point when you'd started to, were they, were you still in contact with them or did you move up to Birmingham? Yeah. So to begin with, no, um, I was still in, Tel I was still in Telford. Yeah. Um, and then I moved to, um, Essex. This yeah. was my chance to escape. Yeah. Um, and then I started having really terrible mental health in Essex. Yes. I couldn't get on with the, the, um, people in Essex. I felt different from everyone. Yeah. It wasn't anything to do with them or their fault. Um, but I just had this terrible feeling in myself. Um, and I still, f the Birmingham gang were calling me to them and I felt more comfortable with them. And I felt like I could be myself with them because I felt like that was my, honest, true self was that I was worthless yeah. and that I, and if other people, um, I was trying to keep up this pretense in, in Essex that I was somebody and I found that really difficult. And I found that really like the, like a responsibility on my shoulders. Because really the Birmingham heavy. gang knew your secret. So you didn't yeah. need to hide it from them yeah. because they were part of that lifestyle. Yes. Yeah. And did they, did they, maintain the same level of kindness that you've described if we can i mean kindness is the wrong word but you understand what i mean in that they, yeah. they weren't like the telford gang or was there a changing yeah. point so um some of them remained kind and some of them turned nasty um but then i would have the ones that were nasty, so I'd have like a really bad experience with them. I might actually get raped by them. Um, and then I would turn back to my friends that were nice to me mm. um, and I would stick with them, even though they had introduced me to the nasty one, mm. if that makes sense. But they would say things, manipulative things like, 
I, I'm sorry that my cousin treated you that way. I'm sorry that um, that happened. I didn't know he was going to do that. But please don't judge me by his behaviour because it wasn't me, it was him. Mm. Um, so they would make me feel that I had a, to be loyal to them because they were loyal to me because they hadn't been the ones that hurt me. It was someone else. So although it's a different gang, and you had had you moved to Birmingham at this point, is that no, no, you had you was to, you were just there. they were calling I was you. Coming back, you were yeah. coming back and forth to yeah, study. Yeah. So even though it was a different gang, ultimately it was still the same manipulation yeah. to get the same end, end game. And yeah. how how long were you then involved with the Birmingham gang for? Um, so I was um, I was involved in the Birmingham gang for on and off for um, about five years. Wow. Okay. Um, I um, for the first year, um, so I was abused um, in um, Telford in two thousand and seven, and then for the first year after that, the whole of two thousand and eight, I was deeply involved with them. Yeah. Um, and then after two thousand and eight, my my mental health was really deteriorating. Mm. I was really suicidal. Um, I really strongly hated myself, um, and I wanted to try and do something about it. I was also learning at university. Um, uh, techniques to s help mental health. Yeah. Um, so um, I was um, becoming wiser as to sort of having ideas of how to get out of the gang and that mm. I wanted to be out of the gang and that I wanted to do something that <laughs> didn't make me feel as bad. And when you say you knew you wanted to be out of the gang, you know, I know it's a very, very complex topic, but I know some people would look and say, well, why didn't you just leave? Mm. What stops you just leaving when you're a, a, somebody that's being victimised by a gang like that? Um, so it's it's something that I would have thought myself as well. Like yeah. sometimes I was in in surrounded by them in a room and thinking to myself, what am I doing here? Why don't I just leave? Um I, you know, and it was another reason that I really hated myself because I could not and I couldn't understand it. Um, but I was, it was another form of PTSD. It was another mm. symptom of PTSD, but I was physically reliving the events or reliving what had happened to me, phys like action, through my actions. And that was making me feel more comfortable than when I was in Essex having terrible flashbacks and feeling very distressed about mm. it. So, it, I mean, it's it's hard to just explain psychologically how it works. Yeah. But I would have, if I didn't, when I tried to stay away from the gang, um, I would start having nightmares. I would start having um, the flashbacks again. Um, I would have really distressing episodes where I could, barely breathe I was so upset um and when I was in the gang in Birmingham that didn't happen anymore mm -hmm. um but it still happened because there were some incidents that were so dangerous I was putting myself in such dangerous situations that I thought one one day I could get killed and what would what would happen then because they wouldn't like this is upsetting to think about, but like these friends of mine, they would probably panic or freak out if they killed me by accident or if they killed me on purpose. What are they going to do with my body? Um, they're not going to call uh, the ambulance. They're not going to call the police and say, oh, um, we've got this dead girl here. They're going to dump me somewhere. Yeah. And, um, and, then, and then my parents are going to find me dumped somewhere. Not my parents finding me, but like find out that there's been a body found and it's me and um and then uh, my parents will never understand or never know yeah. what happened to me so that was a really upsetting thought um and that was the biggest um drive that stopped that made me want to get out of the gang because I did not want that my for my parents to go through that um and I, I felt really distressed about the way my life was going as well. And I didn't want, this wasn't what I had planned. Um, yes. 
as a as a teenager or you know when you think about um your future this is not what I had planned um and every day I could just see myself potentially becoming a sex worker and that being my life and that's not what I and I don't mean one of the um sex workers that make loads of money I mean like I don't know on the street doing drugs um and it's not what I wanted for my life. So it really encouraged me to stay at university. Um, and at, at one time I saw it very, very black and white that I was either at university going to become a nurse or I, or I was going to be a prostitute. Mm. Um, and I only had those options available to me. Wow. I mean, that's quite... When you say there's two options, I mean, they're just su such worlds apart. It's like mm. you were living this incredible double life where the other people at your university that were the same age as you probably had no idea that that was a, a strong potential outcome for you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and what, so what, it sounds like for a lot of people, very understandably, remaining in that space just becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy where you get more and more brainwashed and indoctrinated mm -hmm. into that lifestyle. So how did you finally decide to move out of that area? Mm -hmm. And I don't know what to call it, but, uh, you know, you, you some of these people have been brought to justice, haven't they? Yes. So how did that all come about? Okay. So um, after the year of 2008, when I was not having, you know, I was doing really bad. Um, and then, um, and then I started to try and get away from the gang. Um, I was managing to go quite a few months. Um, it was like an addiction. So it was like, um, I was going cold turkey and like I would manage to go a few months cold turkey without going back. Um, there was drugs involved as well. So perhaps it was drugs pulling me back. Mm -hmm. But I didn't accept that at the time. Um, and um, I decided to, I reported it in 2010, um, what had happened to me in Telford, because um, I was a third year nursing student by then. And um, I had learnt a lot about risks and what um, risks individual people pre present and what is a risk and you know um so somebody who has committed a sexual offense is at risk of doing it again mm -hmm. so there's people that i knew that had commit sexual offenses against me so i have the most proof because it happened against me mm. um and they're at risk of doing it again and some of them i thought or had the feeling that they'd done it before mm. so um I already knew that, that they probably got other victims. Mm. So I started to feel like a, a responsibility on myself as a as in becoming a nurse, um, that I had a responsibility to the public to at least report it. Um, so I, and then I thought if I report it to the police, um, even if it doesn't go anywhere, um, at least I can have that burden relieved off mm -hmm. myself. Um, so, um, I went back to the police, I reported it. Um, I went to the Essex police. Essex police obviously, um, didn't really know anything about Telford. So they took down my details and they took down the details of, um, the people I was reporting and they, um, said, oh, we'll get back to you, but don't hold up any hopes because this is historic. It had mm. been three years by then. Um, and then, um, the Telford police got in touch with me quite quickly and they were actually in the middle of, a, of an investigation oh, okay. um, for the men that I had reported. Right. So um, Ali Sultan was already, had already been reported um, and with the, it was already under under investigation. For similar crimes. Yes. Yeah. For similar crimes. Um, and um, o Operation Chalice had just started taking effect. So um, they um, would, um, came down as quickly as they could basically to come and interview me um uh, it was probably a response that I wasn't expecting mm. um but they probably weren't expecting me to come forward either they were asking me if um if I knew um and they were asking for other people to come forward so they thought that that's why I responded but actually it was complete oh, coincidence wow. okay yeah so I had no idea um and I think 
my PTSD um, was untreated at the time. Um, and I was feeling better because I, probably because I wasn't doing drugs anymore. And um, I was also um, staying away from that lifestyle at the time. Um, and um, I had no idea how unwell I'd been with mm. PTSD. Um, so I didn't realise that I was such a risk of re-traumatisation. And that's what happened when I reported it to the police. They told me about this new, in this investigation that was already ongoing. Then I realised that it was happening to other girls and girls a lot younger than me. And for me, that was absolutely devastating. Like I can't actually explain how bad that actually feels because not only do we is it a, an absolute shock to everyone in the country um i knew what they'd done to me mm -hmm. so the thought of them doing it to other children other girls and ch girls a lot younger than myself was absolutely heartbreaking i was really hoping that it was just me mm. um and i thought it was me i thought it was me i thought it was my fault i thought i'd done things i didn't not realize that um that children were being treated in the same way by the same men um and i found that really difficult to cope with at the time things my mental health really spiraled um and um i ended up uh, attempting suicide um and it was a it was my first i'd been feeling suicidal for about three years and it was my first big um and really my only big suicide attempt um and at the time i was ha so i think that i was suffering some sort of um some psychotic symptoms some mild psychotic symptoms because i believed that shamil was had a demon inside him mm. and that when he raped me he had put a demon inside me mm. and when and that demon would make me behave in ways that i would not want to behave in so i in inhumane ways that would actually hurt me um i think you know part of it was actually you know my ptsd and mm -hmm. this was my way of explaining it but the at the time that i attempted suicide i thought i was had this urge to go back to the gang um which i think was a symptom of like reliving it but i thought it was a demon mm. making me trying to make me go back um and i really did not want to be abused again and i really did not want that life and i thought the only way to stop myself was to kill myself mm. so um it i had a massive um i took a massive overdose um of 58 tablets of codidromol um which made me very sick um i i called a friend because i had this one i lay down to like go to sleep and i just thought what a sad way to end it and then i thought maybe i maybe that maybe that me saying what a sad way to end it means that I don't really want to die. Mm. And then I thought, okay, I better call my friend. So so I called my friend um, and she called an ambulance for me and I went to um, A&E um, and I was very, very sick. I was very unwell. I, was, um, I couldn't stop being sick. It was very traumatic. Um, and I thought afterwards, what did I have to be afraid of if I'm afraid of this gang? I have just realised that I've just proven to myself that I am the most dangerous person to me. Mm -hmm. um, I am the one who's just made a, an attempt on my life. So am I my own attempted murderer, if that makes sense? Mm -hmm. Like no one else has necessarily attempted to murder me, but I have tried to murder myself. So I'm actually... What else, who else have I got to be afraid of? So it, in one way, it spurred me on to continue to um, go ahead with the court case and the investigation. And in another way, it was bad for me because I realised the um, being abused is probably better than being dead. Mm -hmm. So I just went back to the gang. Um, I just did what I was thinking and I just went back and... Um, I don't know if I might have still been a little bit 
like mentally unwell. I think definitely I was mm. because I started to come to like a couple of months later and realise what have I just been doing for the last few months? Like there were probably loads of other, um, loads of things happened. Um, I, I wrote about some of that in, in my book. Mm. Um, and, um, uh, I'm very, very lucky that to be alive after that. At the point that you finally left the Birmingham gang, how many people do you think you've been abused by? Um, so, um, the, um, the number, the number 70 was coined, mm. um, a, like a long time ago in 2013 when I was, um, sort of recruited into, um, speak in a documentary mm -hmm. for um the hunt for britain sex gangs mm -hmm. um and i had created this map which i which is one of the things that i'd done to try and um visualize it to myself and actually when i'd written it down it was kind of looked like a map of a gang which mm -hmm. i didn't expect it to it was like a drug gang you know where everybody's connected to everyone else in total there were 70 people on it um, and I'd kind of um, marked an X on all the ones that I thought were rape and all the ones that I thought were, um, I was very scared. And I changed the, I changed the colours to say, this is um, a situation that I was terrified in. This is a situation where I was um, violently raped in. And, you know, there was 70 on there. And the, um, the reporter from my explanation of it was saying you're describing these situations that seem consensual that you describe as consensual but actually they pushed you and coerced you yeah. into this so you're describing a gang rape um and that was quite heavy for me mm. um but that's how that's how the number 70 sort of came about um but some of it was because I because I was over eighteen, um, by law it would be very complicated to differentiate um, the times that I was very vulnerable and a vulnerable adult, um, and therefore could not consent, um, and the times where I did consent, and the times where um, it was definitely rape, and it would be um, so I didn't report anyone from the Birmingham gang. It would be dangerous to for me um, because. There's so many of them yeah. um, that if I reported any of them, all of them would be against me. Yeah. Um, and then I'd be at risk if I walked down Birmingham. I'm probably at risk anyway, um, but I um, kind of have to ignore that um, yeah. and live my life. Um, so I do. So I won't. I I won't show fear because so far I've had a track record that nobody's nobody's come and threat made a threat against me so so um i don't i'm not going to worry about it even yeah. if other people are worried for me and maybe i should be worried i'm not going to worry because um i can't live my life like that um but yeah that's one reason i haven't reported it another reason is because they might not be um they might not have um might not be convicted anyway mm. there's not much evidence it's very difficult um to um, find enough evidence for those individual incidents where maybe I consented to sleep with this man and then the man who had sex with me afterwards, I didn't want to sleep with him, so that was rape. But how are we going to prove that yeah. if I just had sexual consented s sex with someone else? So it was too, it's too complicated, I think, to try and... That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. But of the ones that you did report in the, mm -hmm. in the Telford gang... Yeah. How many were imprisoned and what were their sentences? Yeah. So um, I, um, I I actually reported um, eight people, eight or nine people. Um, only three of them went to court. Right. Um, and two of them were found guilty um, and one of them was found not guilty. Um, um, yeah, so two... Um, so Shamil and Ali were found guilty. Um, Shamil got um, sentenced to 11 years in prison um, and um, Ali got sentenced to um, six years in prison and a, I think 11 years on licence, I think. Um, I, might, I might be wrong, I've forgotten now, um, because 
um, Ali then was reported again um, by someone else um, and he's still in prison at the moment, even mm. though he served his sentence for me. Um, but um, because he was reported again, um, he's he's still in prison for another for another mm -hmm. sentence, mm -hmm. basically, because he abused so many women. Mm. Um, and the ones that have reported him are just the... Um, uh, are nothing in comparison to the amount of um, people he actually abused. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's quite shocking to hear the story. And you know, when you get to the bit in the story and you say you thought it was just you, because for someone like me who's never been around anything like that, you just don't imagine it's happening. Mm. Do you think it's still happening? And do you think it's happening more than is reported on? You know, what's your view on that? Um, yes. Gangs. Yeah. So it, it's still happening. It's definitely still happening. Um, I think they just find, they've just found ways to hide it or ways of threatening their, um, their victims in, in a different way. Like if you, I think if you report, like they could, they might say things like, if you report me, it's going to be, it's going to blow up and it's going to like, in the media and it's going to be all over it. So, you, so there's more, um, there's more pressure if mm. you decide to report it, um, than there was before. I mean, there was no pressure before because you'd be ignored anyway. Mm. So it was probably like, you might as well report me because they're not going to do anything. Mm. Um, in fact, some, some victims reported it and then were sentenced and were, were charged themselves with something, um, and, um, and have convictions because wow. of things they did while they were being abused. So, um, or as a result of being abused or a result of like getting upset and smashing something because they were abused. And then, um, which is horrendous, horrendous to think about that, that the victims are so heavily blamed mm. by society as well as the men who are abusing them, um, that we will then actually charge them and convict them for something. And when you look back over all of your experiences, you know, what's something you've learned from it? When you look back over everything that happened and you've come out of it as a stronger person who now is, a, um, you know, you describe yourself earlier as a campaigner, would that be the right word? Um, I, I I don't really know what I would describe myself as, yeah. but I, um, because I, I, I always have these um, ideas that I would like to um, do something um, in, in the media to help people. Mm. And then I, I don't do it because I'm actually very shy and um, I um, uh, don't have, I'm trying to fight that confidence still. Mm -hmm. um, but I, um, I really, really want to help people. I want to use my um, skills in mental health nursing and the, um, the, the people who I meet who are become my patients, um, I want to help them and I want to at least them to know that um, because I because I've been through complex trauma that when they've been through complex trauma I can use what I know to help them yeah um, and I can use this the skills that I've learned in my life as well as the skills that I've learned through training um, and actually make make that a comprehensive sort of way of being able to support those people um, and the people that I meet through my work. Um, I, I, I try to do things. Um, I'm trying to do more. I think I will in the future because I, still, I feel like I'm still young. Um, <laughs> and I've even had a way to go with my own mental health before I've been at a stage where I can properly um, help people the way I want to um, and the way I envision. Um, but I want to help other victims. I want to help other survivors. I want to help those girls that no one listens to. Um, and I want to help the girls that are judged by everyone um, and they're not helped because they're judged and not helped because their behaviour has become so complicated and so difficult that other people turn them away when really I know where that where that comes from because even I've struggled with my own behavior and um, I've had to learn interpersonal skills and um, myself to actually overcome that and I want to be able to pass that on um, and show um, other victims and other survivors that actually 
you can achieve what I have and actually get to a, a place in your mind and in your life where you're not suffering anymore from your own mental health and from suicidal thoughts and from that worthlessness. Um, I used to think that I was worthless and um, I used to believe that everybody else was better than me and that I would never amount to anything. Um, and then by, um, I don't know, not by luck, by, I think by never giving up, I have actually come out of the other side of it and I've managed to persevere and I didn't die when I took that overdose and um, I actually m made it through the storm just by getting up every day and, and living and carrying on and then time sort of did the rest. Um, so I, I, I want other people to believe that they can be something and that they can actually... Um, over, overcome what what the what the evil people who have abused them wanted them to believe about themselves um, because it is possible and I don't think that I'm a special case that um, I'm the only one who can survive or I'm the only one that can have this um, like overcome my mental health issues and you know I, I want everyone to be able to do what I've done um, basically um, yeah so um, I, I, that's why I try and pass it on to other people and pass it on to my patients as well. That's a lovely answer. And you say that you're not a special case, but I think you do really come across as a special person. I think you're someone that we've met previously and you're someone that we've talked about a lot. Uh, you come across as very strong, very articulate, and um, I'm really grateful to you to come and talk to us today about a topic that's really hard to talk about but I can tell that the reason you want to do it is because you want to create positive change. Yeah. So okay. thank you for your time. Oh, um, yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. Um, it's, a, um, it's a pleasure to be here because um, I really want um, to, for, you know, I, I, I hope from these interviews or, um, with, with the Lad Bible that I can actually reach more um, victims and survivors um, and let them know that... Um, there's someone out there who understands you and there's someone out there in a position to help who is trying to help. Um, and um, they don't have to be the ones to come forward and talk about it. I'll talk about it. I'll talk about the horrible things that happened to me. Embarrass myself, but not embarrass myself um, so that other people don't feel that they have to come forward unless they feel comfortable to. Um, yeah, um, it's not for the trolls. <laughs> Should we give it a little? I think that's, yeah. Sorry. Thank you, Kate. <laughs> I looked to the side of the cutter and she had a jar with things in it, clitoris, libia, mojo, everything that she has cut previously. I looked at it and I thought I'm going to die. And then being sown, the one experience that I don't think I will ever forget.